We will conclude today's ceremony later <laughs> by singing the alma mater. But before that, I would like to give you my charge. It's a great pleasure to be here with you for my first commencement. Once again, on behalf of all of us sitting on the stage, let me congratulate all the gra graduates and your families on your wonderful achievement. This is my freshman year at CMU. And as a freshman, I get to speak at the commencement. Not bad. I said, what a country. <laughs> the first thing I did upon arriving here was to launch a year-long listening tour. Listening to students, faculty, alumni, trustees, and staff to get to know Carnegie Mellon. Many of you graduating today, many of you students who are leaving the campus today, played a very important role in my listening tour. I thank you for your help. I heard so many powerful ideas from you and from all across the CMU community. Thank you. I'm pleased to report that we could convert a number of your ideas into action during the first year, during my first year. You strongly suggested a new campus-wide seed grant funding program to allow us to move forward to nurture the creative entrepreneurial spirit of the CMU community. Your idea led to the launch of Proceed, a program we announced a few months ago. This year, you very kindly organized a series of symposia for my inauguration year entitled Crossing Boundaries and Transforming Lives on some major research and education challenges of our time. And you brought leading experts from around the world to campus to talk about these topics. Thank you. We secured the foundational gifts to develop a major new gateway to our campus, the Tepper Quad. This year, David Tepper provided the largest gift ever in the history of the university by a CMU alumnus. Thank you, David. <laughs> this new project will catalyze our activity in entrepreneurship and innovation across the university and create a new home for the business school. We also announced the Simon Initiative involving faculty from every college and school on the campus to build on CMU's global leadership in learning science to deliver effective learning outcomes. 2014 is, as you know, the 100th anniversary of our renowned School of Drama. We celebrated this landmark in Pittsburgh in New York City, and in Hollywood just two weeks ago. We established a new partnership with the Tony Awards, the first for a university to recognize outstanding and inspiring theater educators in American K through 12 schools. And of course, CMU itself has produced so many wonderful mentors who have changed the landscape of entertainment and theater. We also have created innovative new partnerships with major IT companies such as IBM and Yahoo. And just last week, directly in response to many comments I received from my listening tour, especially from many of the graduating students, we announced a major university-wide priority to create a large number of presidential scholarships for undergraduate students and presidential fellowship for graduate student, students. We launched this important initiative with an initial endowment pool of $30 million specifically raised for this purpose. Thank you for suggesting this, and thank you to all the benefactors for helping us to launch this very important activity. So it's been a very busy and productive year for all of us. I'm most grateful to all who have contributed to make all of this happen. You are privileged to have amazing choices before you. 
I will confidently predict one thing. The pace of change will accelerate and bring incredible new capabilities for us. Graduates, in your lifetime, information and communication technologies have opened doors in so many new directions. They have allowed hundreds of millions of people around the world to move out of poverty and seize new opportunities across the entire spectrum of human action and thought. As new ideas take hold in one sphere, they have an impact that ripples across many other domains. For example, it was advances in computer science that made possible the mapping of the human genome which in turn has generated new tools for medical diagnosis and treatment and has opened new intellectual domains in personalized medicine and big data. Big data analytics and machine learning are already changing how we learn, how we work, what we buy, how we travel, and how we govern ourselves. I wish to briefly discuss two topics for the new graduates as you leave this campus. The first topic deals with the perspective with which you approach major challenges, whether they are your challenges or global challenges. The second deals with leadership. The US National Academy of Engineering, a select group of top Amer leaders in engineering from America, in 1999 published a list of 20 greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. You could probably guess what was on that list. You can go to their website and see it. Electrification, commercial aviation, the invention of the radio, television, and the internet, the development of fossil fuels, and in turn, the invention of the automobile and the creation of the major highway networks, improvements in agricultural productivity, and the rise of nuclear energy. These have been enormously beneficial to humankind, and their adoption happened very quickly, with many of them arising in the lifetime of your parents and your grandparents. The US National Academy of Engineering in 2005 issued another list, this time the list of the 14 greatest challenges facing humanity in the 21st century. Here are a few of them develop carbon sequestration methods, restore and improve urban infrastructure, engineer better medicines, prevent nuclear terror, secure cyberspace. When you compare these two lists side by side, it is striking how many of the 21st century challenges directly spring from the unintended consequences of the 20th century achievements. It is because of the rise, rise in the petroleum-based world economy that we must address the consequences of the buildup of carbon in the atmosphere, including pollution and carbon sequestration. The spread of the internet connectivity that began in the late 20th century has brought countless benefits to our lives and careers, from banking to entertainment to, of course, Shutterfly. But through this technology, we also face problems of securing cyberspace, protecting our privacy, preventing media piracy, and countering cyber terrorism. Some might say that this is nothing unique to our time. In the late Middle Ages, innovative designs for faster ships created richer tra trading connections around the Mediterranean and beyond. But those faster ships also eventually brought with them the bubonic plague that devastated major cities in Central Asia and Europe. So unintended consequences are not new, but what is new today is the speed with which such consequences occur. The global air travel system that makes it possible for us to jet around the world also allows infectious diseases, bacteria, viruses, and parasites to fly right along with us. So how are we going to solve the grand challenges of the 21st century, some of which may be a direct consequence of the 20 greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century? If we, as scholars, creative minds, engineers, and scientists were so smart in the last century in creating so many innovations that changed the world, how much smarter 
are we likely to be just within a few decades as a human race that we will have the wisdom to solve all the unintended consequences we created along the way. As we work to solve new challenges, what new unintended consequences will arise and how do we know them? There is no simple answer to this. My own interpretation is that it is not just enough to look at grand challenges as engineering challenges, technological challenges, or scientific challenges. They are also human challenges. Most of these unintended consequences facing the world have their roots in the human condition. Here is an example. The National Science Foundation, which I headed until last year, has long funded important research to develop sophisticated tools to provide early warnings for such serious weather events as tornadoes and hurricanes. This work has led to very useful tools and technologies that improve our predictions. But every year, despite getting much better forecasts, dozens of people still die in tornadoes and hurricanes. I learned that such tra tragedies often occur not because of our inability to accurately predict bad weather events, but because of our inability to predict how, would pe how people would react to warnings about bad weather events. Human behavior, as much as technology, is important here. In 1850, a few years after the legendary inventor, Michael Faraday, first produced electricity in his lab in London, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, or the Treasury Secretary of England, William Gladstone, was among the many skeptics who could not imagine how electricity could be anything more than a parlor trick by a scientist who is using taxpayer money to satisfy his curiosity. So Mr. Gladstone said, Mr. Faraday, what is the value of your new invention of electricity? Why should we support your scientific curiosity? This is what Gladstone asked. Mr. Faraday responded, sir, one day you will tax it. And, and tax they did. We are still paying heavy taxes for energy and electricity around the world. Faraday's witty answer to Gladstone points to one important lesson about technologies. We are often not good at predicting the full range of their effects, especially when, as is all too common, short-term priorities, narrow focus, override long-term analysis. If we approach major problems with an expansive human-centered framework, we can collectively create an inclusive society that will find a way for human contributions to be made with dignity, strength, and beauty. So what does it take? It requires seriously combining perspectives from science and engineering on the one hand with contributions of artists, designers, architects, social scientists, humanists, or those trained in economics, business, and policy. Working together, we must continue to build new approaches designed with careful attention to the needs and capacities of the human beings who will use them, who will abuse them, and who will be changed by them. Studies also suggest that the fields of entertainment, music, and the arts, appropriately combined with the latest in technology, can improve learning outcomes in areas as diverse as learning languages, sciences, and engineering. And this is where CMU excels. I think, first of all, this requires us to collaborate on teams that include many disciplines, partnership of the sort that has long flourished at a place like Carnegie Mellon University. This is why I firmly believe that CMU's unique strengths in crossing boundaries will position us to be global leaders in addressing many of the grand challenges that the National Academy of Engineering talked about more so than any other university. At CMU, you have been well prepared here to take this approach to your future work, wherever you may work. And of course, you have just officially joined the worldwide network of 97,000 Carnegie Mellon alumni 
who will connect with you in making this happen, who will work with you. This brings me to my second and final point, leadership. Here I want to reiterate a few things that I said to student leaders just a couple of days ago. Peter Drucker, the thoughtful observer of organizations, once said, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. At CMU, your experiences have helped you to focus on the right things and also helped you learn how to do them the right way. Take this to the world with a broader perspective to address the grand challenges. Go outside your comfort zone. Someone once said, leaders take their people where they want to go. Great leaders take their people where they ought to go, even if they initially do not want to go there. As you become leaders in whatever you choose to do, be prepared to step outside your comfort zone, not recklessly, but taking calculated risks. This has been said by others before. Good judgment comes from experience, but often experience comes from bad judgment. As serious as the problems facing this planet are, on this day, looking at you, I cannot help but be optimistic, deeply optimistic about the future. And I look forward with high hopes for what all of you graduates will accomplish in the many years to come. I know that you are prepared enough, creative enough, and powerful enough to take on anything. Congratulations again, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my freshman year with you. I, I, I shall always remember you, the class of 2014, as my first CMU graduating class. Thank you.